Thursday, 27th of November 2014. In Johannesburg, church leaders come together under the banner, SACC vital yesterday, today and tomorrow. Their passionate vision that the SACC will once more become the spiritual and moral compass of the country to advocate justice and delivery for the poor, marginalized and disenfranchised and hold political leaders accountable. Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu delivers the keynote address. My very dear sisters and brothers, what a great, great privilege it is to come and to meet with all of you, to seek to revive a body that, too, it worked. This is what helped us to survive. The, the SACC helped us not only to survive, but ultimately to triumph. So God is saying, in my day, please help me, please help me, please help me. We, we were given this land. You, what a beautiful country with beautiful people, but God is weeping. God looks at South Africa and says, oh, I was so proud in 1994. I was so proud of South Africa. I was so proud when I saw them in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I, I said to the world, you see, look, look at my children. This is how I want you to be. What are we doing? Why are we doing what we are doing? Why? Why? But we're not going away crying. We have come here we have come to be revived. We want the SACC back alive because we know just how God used us, every one of us, every one of us. We were part of the struggle. Now we've got to be part of the building up of this beautiful land. Built on the foundations of colonial conquest, the policy of racial segregation or apartheid was introduced by the Nationalist Party government in May 1948. South Africans would be classified, divided and segregated in every conceivable way along racial lines. Of significance by design, apartheid was sanctioned and given theological justification by the white Dutch Reformed Church. As such, it was proclaimed as the will of God. In Cape Town, District 6 was one of the first black communities to be forcibly uprooted and relocated to the Cape Flats, in line with racial zoning under the Apartheid Group Areas Act. My family was one of the first families who were forcibly removed under the Group Areas Act in Cape Town. And we were put out onto the Cape Flats and I joined my first political organization at the age of 13. And the reason why I did was that as a poor black girl child, the entire system was just geared towards making you complicit in your oppression. And so for me, the only way you could uh, retain your dignity and your, any sense of personal integrity was in fact just to fight back with everything in your power. When we were at secondary school, one was already politically aware about 1965, when my mother's sister came very sick to Soweto uh, to sleep over and then go to Barra because the Barra was the best hospital. And she came from Bushbuck Ridge. And she arrived at 10 o'clock. 
two o'clock in the morning, the police came to arrest her because she had no permit. I mean, even if you are a young person, you are 15 years old, and the first thing in the morning is that you go and visit her. She has been made to sleep on a cement floor with seven operations in her system. I mean, you, 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 you must be convinced about how evil this system is. And we got to the beach, and hugely excited. We just unpacked the Sunday lunch and the blankets and everything. And so my dad was now taking us into the water. And then I just saw these two white men. One was wearing a hat and one was wearing a pullover, a neck pullover. And they called my dad and he just left my sister and I and he went off with them. And you could see there was quite a strong exchange of words. And he came back and then he said to us we had to leave. And we were like, no. <laughs> we just got here. And he just said, no, we are going. And what it was, was that these were two white policemen who told my father that we were contravening in terms of the Group Aries Act and that this was a whites only beach. And who actually put my father, who considered himself in a very patriarchal sort of way, you know, as the head of his family. And it made me years later think quite a lot about what apartheid did to a distorted sense of ma masculinity that poor black men had anyway. You're supposed to protect your family, you're supposed to supply them with food and holidays and things, and you just can't. So you're not a man. And it leads to all kinds of pathologies, I believe, uh, in, in families and in society, much of which we're still living with today. At the core of the apartheid design was the dispossession of black South Africans of their citizenship. Every black person was to be ethnically linked to one of ten homelands or Bantistans. Puppet heads of state appointed by the apartheid regime would then declare independence for their particular Bantustan. In 1976, the Transkei took independence followed by Bapututswana on the 6th of December 1977. With independence, every black South African ethnically linked to that homeland would lose their citizenship to become citizens of the new sham Bantustan. In this way, the black majority would ultimately be stripped of their citizenship and relegated to 13% of the land, with no political rights in white South Africa. Their entry and access would be strictly controlled by the past laws, in accordance with the labor requirements of the white economy. In the process, all black people historically living outside of the planned Bantustans were being systematically uprooted and relocated into these homeland areas. By 1980, some two million had been uprooted and dumped in relocation camps in the Bantustans, with a further three million scheduled for relocation. I beg them to stop that diabolical policy. I beg them, because I am going to use all the resources I have got. And if they want to know the direction in which I'm taking the Southern Council of Churches, the direction is we are focusing on that homelands policy and the resettlement and uprooting of our people. That is where the ACCC is going to be spending its resources to ensure that that policy is destroyed. In 1978, an amazing thing happened. Desmond Tutu became the General Secretary of the South African Council of Churches, and that changed everything. And the voice that began to be heard from the top of the SACC was a black voice. That was critically important at the time. It meant that Desmond could speak with absolute authority uh, about the issues faced by black South Africans. It got us to, to hear this South Africa's pain from below. Well, I've visited quite a few of the so-called resettlement camps, which is a nice name for dumping grounds for human beings who are uprooted from their former homes where they lived as a family near the place of work of the breadwinner. And they are dumped in these arid areas in the Bandustans. There is not very much work uh, 
around the resettlement camps. There isn't very much food available. The able-bodied men are away working as migrant laborers. And the women and the old and the very young try to eke out a, a miserable existence. This particular visit to a resettlement camp outside Queenstown called Zweledinga. I met a little girl who just came out of a shed in which she lived with a widowed mother and a sister. And I asked her, does your mother get a grant or a pension or something? She said, no. Then I said, well, what do you do for food? And she said, we borrow food. And you look around the camp and wonder who would be able to lend anybody food since the uh, resources seem so minimal. And I said, what happens if you can't borrow food? And she said, we drink water to fill our stomachs. And I have vowed that uh, it's a system that we will have to do everything in our power to see stopped. But Desmond Tutu, here was one of us, um, a very courageous man, and also somebody who, who, who succeeded in bringing his very deep piety, his faith, together with his resistance um, against apartheid. And when we were in confrontations with people like P.W. Buerta, for instance, that's the voice that spoke to him. Desmond could bridge two worlds. He was a product of black South Africa, but he was also a product of a very sophisticated uh, international experience. Uh, so he could speak eye to eye with anybody. He, his gift of articulation, of course, was was a massive gift to the whole country. The Bible is radical in the original sense that it goes to the root. It is the most revolutionary thing there is around. It is one of the most subversive things that you can ever have when there is injustice and oppression and exploitation. And, dear friends, I am sorry, but it is here, it is from this that we get our mandate. Now, you shouldn't, I mean, you know, you spoke about the missionary movement. Well, maybe they should not have brought it. <laughs> because, quite frankly, we are taking it seriously. <laughs> And then there was the, the international scene. Uh, who had the credibility in South Africa to speak to the world about what was really happening here, to tell the truth? We needed to tell the truth and expose the lies of the, of the regime, which Desmond Tutu did magnificently, in my view. Do you feel that um, economic pressure on South Africa will force the government to negotiate with people like Nelson Mandela? I, I have consistently said that it is important to find a way of persuading uh, the authorities here to come to the negotiating table and to speak with the authentic leaders of the various uh, sections of our community. And, and for us blacks, those are people like Nelson Mandela. There's no question at all. They have to negotiate with him in our community. He is the leader uh, with people like uh, Oliver Tambo. And I, I made it quite clear, too, that the situation here has uh, deteriorated quite considerably. Uh, I mean, the government is spending millions telling half-truths and lies um, about the situation here. I mean, it's important that people are told the truth. The truth speaks for itself. I mean, I didn't need to embellish it. I mean, I just needed to say to people, this is the truth. And I, and I said so to, to the various people I saw, the senators I saw, the big black uh, congressional caucus, and I said, this is the truth, that the situation is worsening here, uh, and that they ought to do something quickly 
before we have an explosion. We had to go into what is the role of the General Secretary of the SACC. And we came to the conclusion that God had placed a prophet amongst us and that our job was to assure him that he had the freedom to speak what he heard God saying to him because we needed to hear prophetic voices at that time. I'm thankful. I'm deeply thankful that the spiritual is so real that when I say there is nothing they can do to me and I want to challenge them even today, I say there is absolutely nothing they will do to me which will stop me. For my loyalty is not to any human being. The system, the system tries all it can to destroy us. It won't succeed. I want to tell you, it won't succeed. It won't succeed. Because God, God is on our side. And he is the God of liberation. Yes. He is the God who's going to lead us, all of us in South Africa, for none, for none is free until we are free. And we want you, we want, I keep begging white people, I say, join us. Join the winning side. Join, join the winning side. With liberation movements banned and political leaders either incarcerated on Robben Island or in exile, the 16th of June 1976, students in Soweto staged a peaceful march against Bantu education and Afrikaans as the language of instruction. Police opened fire and some 76 students were killed. Hundreds were injured. Mass detentions followed. This all happened at the time of the emergence of black consciousness. Black consciousness meant that for the first time we said, how is it possible that we are black churches with a majority of black members, but still we have white leadership? How is it possible that we are black people from Africa, and yet our theology is completely dictated by people from Europe with a Eurocentric point of view? What about an African center? point of view. What about black theology? And so black theology rose at the same time that black consciousness rose. I mean, on the campus, I was challenged on just about everything. What does it mean to have faith? Why do you call yourself a Christian? Why do you want to be a Christian in a country where, where Christianity is the source of our oppression and the justification of our oppression? And of course, every time the students went on the streets, and there was a demonstration and people got wounded or jailed or tortured or killed, they came to us. In Elsa's River, there was this mother, Mrs. Fortain, who heard that the students were going to march and she knew that meant a clash with the police. She was worried about her youngest son who had stayed behind school to read in the library. She sent the older boy, uh, who was 10 years old, Bernard, to go and fetch his brother. He went, got caught up in the thing, got shot by the police. By the time she got there, police had formed a cordon around the body because he was not dead yet. He was bleeding. And the mother came and she said, it's my son, it's my son. And the policeman took his gun is a rifle and hit her with a gun butt and said to her, let the bastard die. Now, that, I think, encapsulates just about everything. The disdain for life, the hatred for the people, the ruthlessness with which uh, the South African government was suppressing, the callousness, and uh, sort of sending the message day after day after day, since Soweto, we will do whatever it takes to maintain power, even if it means to kill your children. And so, faced with that, the churches really had no choice. Time for pious words was over. Because, you see, people like ourselves are one day going to be pushed aside. The people are going to say nonsense. Those leaders, they keep talking about peace, and our people keep getting killed. When, when people try to fight against this system, they are detained without trial, they are banned. I'm offering to the government 
I'm offering to the government that we in the churches, if they like, I, I would be ready to act as a broker if they really wanted to set up negotiations. Because there are only two ways to freedom in South Africa. The one way is through sitting down and talking, which we say, let us do. The other, and there is no middle way, I, all this is nonsense, I'm for middle way. There are only two options. We either talk or we fight. And I am still saying, we want to help you. South African government, South African whites, we want to help you to talk. We want you to be alive when freedom comes. Operating through church networks that reached the most remote corners of South Africa, the SACC ministered to the oppressed and marginalized through its numerous dedicated task divisions. The Dependents Conference ministered to the families of political prisoners and detainees. With grants for education and subsistence, the Council ensured that the assessed material needs of the family were provided for in the absence of the breadwinner. At the same time, they provided legal representation for political detainees and prisoners, whilst encouraging and facilitating visits by the family to Robin Island. While the Council boldly opposed forced removals, they recognized the spiritual plight and material needs of those uprooted and dumped in this way. The Division of Interchurch Aid ministered to marginalized communities dumped in the desolate rural relocation areas by implementing self-help community development schemes to help the people survive and become more self-reliant. Other SACC task divisions included mission and evangelism, home and family life, theological education and youth leadership. Concerned with matters of justice and peace, the Division of Justice and Reconciliation, headed by Dr. Wolfram Kistner, set up study commissions on racism, relocations, foreign investment and faith and ideology to stimulate theological reflection on issues affecting human rights and the restoration of human dignity. And he, to my mind, was the intellectual of the SACC. He was a philosopher, a great theologian. He would sit in meetings and whenever people debated on theological grounds, any aspect of injustice, um, there were many voices. And at the end, Dr. Kistner would say, yeah, well, I've written something on that if anybody wants to read it. And he would have actually encapsulated the debate in a theological paper months before anybody had thought of discussing it. He really was a very humble man but a man who constantly brought people back within the context of a struggle to the theology of justice. And so for those field workers, um, he provided, I think, the moral framework for a lot of what they did. For SACC staff members and field workers, their dedication and work in the council was an extension of their own personal commitment to serving the community at large. The field workers are the unsung heroes, of course, of the SACC's struggle years. They were very, very courageous. They worked in very hostile environments. For instance, Mbaputachwana, uh, under the very repressive rule of Lucas Mangope at the time, going to people who were suffering and being alongside them and bringing a measure of healing to their lives, a measure of encouragement. I think of Tom Mantata, a young Catholic who was, in a sense, almost on death row for a long period of time. Many humble, committed field workers across the country. 1983, Prime Minister P.W. Borta holds a referendum amongst the white electorate for his proposed new constitution. 
this new constitution would give Khalids and Indians limited political rights in their own communities through a sham backyard tricameral parliamentary system. The intention to divide the black community with Khalids and Indians co-opted to form a buffer between the privileged white minority and the disenfranchised black majority stripped of their South African citizenship and relegated to the Bantustans. The work that we have been doing with the students since 1976, under the banner of black consciousness, which meant that we rejected the labels Indian and colored uh, and, 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 and Bantu and so forth, because we knew that the labels designated different social status uh, according to the drips and drabs that the South African government would give in order to divide and rule. So the coloreds would have a bad education, but would be a better education than Bantu education. Coloreds would not be paid very well, but they would be paid better than the Bantus would be paid for the same job, that kind of thing. Making sure that we fight amongst each other about the so-called privileges we were getting instead of looking at the source of the problem. And I believe that most colored people will be as responsible as the white people and will come forward and accept what is being offered to them to, to improve their position in their land of birth and the same will happen with the Indians. And we asked the question, what would happen to that solidarity we have built since 1976 and to the feeling of common struggle that we all have and a common future that we shared if we give in to this thing? What would it say of us if we accept these limited, bogus, little, little, little privileges, the crumbs from the apartheid table, to the exclusion of the vast majority of our people. Finally, we wish to express our confidence in our brothers and sisters in both the Indian and colored communities that having been part of a long tradition of unity and suffering and struggling together will not desert us at this crucial hour of history. Freedom! Founded on the tenets of the Freedom Charter on the 20th of August 1983, the United Democratic Front was launched in response to a call by the Reverend Dr. Alan Bussack for a united front to oppose the government's proposed new constitution. It would be non-violent but militant. Um, another thing I learned from Albert Lutuli, he talked about non-violent militancy. We are struggling for our human dignity and we are struggling for the future of our children. We shall never give up. But another reason why we reject these proposals is that the homeland's policy, which is surely the most immoral and objectionable aspect of the apartheid policies of the government, forms the basis of the willful exclusion of 80% of our nation from the new political deal. Indeed, in the words of the proposals of the President's Council, the homeland's policy is to be regarded as irreversible. And so our African brothers and sisters will be driven even further into the wilderness of homeland politics. Millions will have to find their political rights in the sham independence of those Bush republics. And millions more will continue to lose their South African citizenship and millions more will be forcibly removed from their homes into the desolation of resettlement camps. We drew people from every community across racial lines, cultural lines, religious lines, people who didn't believe Jews for justice. In the Muslim community, the call of Islam. And I was so amazed at the young people, their clarity of mind, because we've had all these conversations. So I knew they knew why they were there. I believed in the struggle begins up here first, before you go onto the streets. Unless you understand your condition of oppression, why are we fighting? And unless you understand what we are fighting for, unless you understand who is my enemy in this thing. So that's why the non-racial element was so important. Because we said to ourselves, if we embrace the Freedom Charter, that means we're not going to think racially. Every person, whoever they might be, 
who are as committed as we are in the struggle. Let them all come. Let them all come. Let them join us. And the UDF became the largest non-racial, non-violent movement our country has ever seen. It was an idea as the old cliche whose time had come. An idea whose time had come. Initiating a culture of mass mobilization inside South Africa, the UDF marked a turning point in the struggle against apartheid. Within a year of its formation, the front had a membership of over three million supporters. We'll keep on rejecting this constitution because it will be based on apartheid. Headquarters of the South African Council of Churches, the UDF, Black Sash, and other progressive anti-apartheid movements, by 1983, Khotsal House, the House of Peace, had become a symbol of hope and refuge for those seeking assistance and relief from apartheid oppression. May the witness of this house make its contribution to the day when the kingdoms of this whole world become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. When our Father's house is truly a house of prayer for all nations. Of course, the house was a sign of hope. It was a place where everybody in that building was working for a better South Africa. Some were trade unionists, many were church people, there were people like Black Sash. And so when you walked in there, you walked into the new South Africa. We, the people of Koso House, dedicate ourselves, our talents and our programs to the service of God and of all his people in this land. But it also was a refuge for UDF activists and leaders. If there was an issue, um, you would have people coming together of different cultures, different races, different faiths, and it was a time of incredible unity against a common enemy. Although we worked in such traumatic times, it was traumatic, we had the most amazing sense of camaraderie. UDF people, the churches, everybody, they just banded together against this one enemy. It's a period I'll never forget because it was a very special period. That was a place of refuge. We were known for being the place to come to. And in fact, we were manned at the bottom by a desk that had a button so that when the police came in, they rang the button. So if Khotsa House got raided in the 80s, um, you would have the police coming in one door and we would be secreting UDF activists out of another door across the road into St Mary's Cathedral across the road, um, into one of the little naves where we would pretend to pray. And we would have other comrades who would... Um, put on an old jacket of somebody in the black sash queue and pretend to be waiting for the advice office. So it was a, a sense of immense solidarity and it brought people very closely together. The law of apartheid brings about an institutionalized injustice which results in a denial of fundamental human rights to the black population of South Africa. It is in this context that the church is called to proclaim the word of God, which is about God's love, God's truth, and God's justice. The Black Sash was a nonviolent women's resistance organization founded in 1955, run by white women. Wearing a symbolic black sash across their chest, these women held regular street demonstrations protesting against human rights abuses. They also brought cases of injustice to the attention of their members of parliament. During 1982, more than 200,000 black people were arrested for past law offences across South Africa, and some 12,000 victims of influx control regulations approached the Black Sash Advice Office at Khotso House for help. In 1983, the Transvaal Rural Action Committee was established as a project of the Black Sash to assist communities under threat of forced removal. Driefontein in Natal and Mokhopa in the Northwest were two communities under threat who approached the Black Sash and Track for assistance. 
the people of Mahopa, after many acts on the part of the government to try and inadvertently force them to move, such as cutting off the water supply, bulldozing the school, stopping paying the pensions, and saying to people, your children can go to school once they've moved into Baputitswana. Um, the pensions will be paid there. Um, you will have water there. And at every turn, we had blocked those inadvertent moves of the government through court cases and exposure through the press. So eventually, the gloves came off, and the government gave the community a date of removal. And that was in 1983. So we organized a church vigil for the evening before the date of removal, and we sat with the community under the Lakhotla tree and prayed through the night. And the press were there, embassy diplomats were there, as well as church leaders such as Archbishop Tutu. And the trucks never came, but the government could play a waiting game. So on the 14th of February 1984, at 3 o'clock in the morning, the army put up a roadblock and the removal trucks came into Mohopa. No one was allowed in to the community of Mohopa while the removal took place at gunpoint. Equally violent in April 1983, while addressing an outdoor meeting, Driefontein community leader Saul Mkiza was murdered by a young South African police constable. The policeman fired two shots from his shotgun, the first into a nearby tree, and the second into the chest of Saul Mkiza. And then we went, we were trying to rush him to the hospital, but he didn't arrive at the hospital, he was dead already. Two weeks prior, Saul's son Parrish had been detained and systematically beaten by nine policemen, demanding to know why his father was spearheading resistance to relocation of the community. He was shot by a police. That means he was shot by the government of South Africa. We are not prepared to move at all. Our leader is dead here. We will die here. That is all. Resolute with the death of their leader, the community under the mobilization of Mrs. Beauty Mkize stood their ground and against all odds resisted and ultimately triumphed, thwarting the removal. In 1987, the South African government relented and reluctantly informed the community that they were no longer earmarked for relocation. <laughs> As part of their campaign against the SACC, the government set up the Elof Commission of Inquiry into the operations and funding of the council. The intention, to slander the council and provide the authorities with the justification needed to cut off access to overseas donor funding, a vital lifeline to the SACC and its task divisions. The Elof Commission was P.W. Buda's first major attempt to put the SACC out of business. Um, he wanted to prove, and he thought he could, that we were in cahoots um, day by day with the African National Congress and other liberation movements. So for a couple of years, we had the security police turning over every stone in our lives and in our backgrounds and in what we'd said and done and spending time in courts or house. Oh, we agreed then. Desmond and I bookended the hearings he opened with a magnificent statement. And, uh, and I remember he, he took the commission through a Bible study from Genesis to Revelation. I don't think they've ever suffered such a long sermon in their lives. But it was magnificent. And essentially what he was saying is, we know what it means to be church. And in the SACC, that's all we're doing. We're being church. We're doing the things God would want us to do. And if you can show us that we're doing anything outside of the parameters of what, uh, you know, then let me give you a Bible study to show you wrong. And he did. In a massive demonstration of international support for the work of the South African Council of Churches, an international delegation of representatives from the Pope in Rome, the World Council of Churches in Geneva, and church councils from around the world, traveled to Johannesburg and demanded to appear before the commission. They said, we've, they've come from all over the world to, to tell this commission 
that it's not just the SACC that they're seeking to put on trial. It's the world church. It's Christians around the world. And they, they are going to speak about the integrity of this body that they respect so much in South Africa. A very moving moment. In 1984, Archbishop Desmond Tutu was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. This award intensified the international spotlight on the work of the South African Council of Churches and encouraged support for the SACC's call for international pressure against the South African regime. That was the international turning point. And that was a signal to the regime that the tide is turning. Um, the people who oppose you are now being regarded as people worthy of the highest honor on this planet. You, the regime, are the problem. You are the cause of war. You are the cause of struggle. You are the cause of strife. It's not the other way around. Your propaganda has failed. The world now honors the people who oppose you as the true messengers of peace in Southern Africa. So I do think it was a very important turning point Without it, I think things would have gone on much longer than 1994. With increased support from the international community and the groundswell of pressure from the mass democratic movement inside South Africa, the SACC intensified the church struggle against apartheid and by the mid-1980s was identified by the regime as enemy number one. On the 1st of September 1988, under direct orders from Prime Minister P.W. Boerta, security force operatives made their move. In the end, this, this man Boerta, who had tried in so many ways through the ELOF Commission and other ways to destroy the SACC, said we must blow it up. And they did. It's three o'clock in the morning. The bomb exploded and the car had been carefully parked next to the lift shaft so that when the bomb exploded, it traveled up the lift shaft and at every floor, the force of the bomb would flatten all the partitions on that floor. It was like a house of cards falling down on every floor. And the workers who slept in the very top floor of Hutz House um, were blown out of their beds, but they, they weren't killed. I got a phone call to come through because we as a church had a, a, a block of flats where we cared for elderly people, immediately opposite. And, and of course it suffered enormous damage and there were people injured. So I came through in, in the small hours of the morning and just saw this scene of horror um, with you know desks hanging out of windows and uh, smashed uh, rubble all over the street. The only thing that really hadn't been destroyed in the building was the tapestry as you came into the, the, the foyer of the building. There was this enormous tapestry with Christ, with his arms outstretched saying, welcome to Hotza House, the house of peace. And it was, for me, incredibly symbolic that that wasn't destroyed. That blast was the death knell of that regime. When you start blowing up church headquarters in order to survive, you're already finished. You're done. Accommodated in nearby church buildings and struggle lawyers' offices, the SACC and NGOs picked up the pieces and carried on regardless before moving to their new headquarters in downtown Marshall Street. Resolute in their determination at that time in the dark days of 1988, it was nevertheless difficult for even the most optimistic to imagine that the day of freedom and democracy being sacrificed and fought for would dawn within a mere Decade. If I think back, I get goosebumps because I didn't believe I would be free. All of us thought there were only three options and routes in our life. They were either going to kill us because we know a large number of people who have been killed, or they were going to put us in jail for a very long time, and in those days, life meant life, or we would have to flee into exile. Those were the only three routes 
It was an exciting moment for everybody. Nobody believed it would happen, it did happen. And it was a moment of celebration for the whole country. The excitement throughout the country and the world was amazing. What a day, what a day. It's one of those day of days. And if one was fortunate enough to be alive, that is the day that you will carry um, to your death. And as I was, you know, watching the ceremony on television and deeply moved, of course, and excited by it, I looked up the hill out of our kitchen window and I saw the Church of Christ the King standing up there in what used to be Sophia Town. And I remembered that there was a priest there whose name was Trevor Huddleston. And I remembered that there was an altar boy by the name of Desmond Tutu. And I remember that Desmond Tutu was so influenced by this, this priest and his, his courageous stand. And I, I somehow felt the link between those two places. And I said to myself, thank you, God, because essentially, uh, essentially the man being sworn in as our new president would not be there were it not for the witness not just of that little church and what it did in the life of one young black kid but right across the nation the only way we are going to survive in this country is Manacled together by our common humanity, we come out struggling together, black and white. The only way we can be human is together, manacled to each other, black and white. The only way we can ever be free in this country together, manacled together, black and white.